Hey, thank you everybody for joining in. Welcome to uh, Men's Leadership Network podcast edition. Um, you know, we have these great seasons where on Thursday mornings we gather at the Rolling Hills campus with a group of men and Pastor Jeff interviews somebody on stage about life or ministry or leadership or family and what God's doing and how we can all learn and grow. Um, we have several satellite locations that meet during those seasons. In the off times when we're not meeting regularly on Thursday mornings, we love to um, gather a couple of podcasts that we can keep the pipeline going, things that we can learn and glean from one another. And so today I get the privilege um, of being with my friend Alex Brown um, just to talk about all that God is doing in his life and to explore the things that we can learn together. I'm going to pray for us before we begin the interview process, and we'll trust that God's going to do good things today. Can I pray? Yes, sir. Father, thank you so much for this day of life. Um, thank you so much for um, the incredible Christmas season that we celebrated together and this brand new year that we get to embark upon. Um, God, we know that you have plans, um, that you have desires, that you have designs for us in this upcoming year. And we pray that we as men, um, as, as husbands, as fathers, as leaders in our community and in our workplace, that you would um, pour into us so that we may be poured out um, for Jesus in all of the places that you have us, God. Um, may we be light in dark places. Um, may we be influencers um, in all the arenas that you have us. And Father, help us to be learners, um, people that can take the things that we gather from Scripture and that we gather from one another's lives and apply to our own so that we can be better fit for the service of our King, who is Jesus. Uh, we celebrate him today. Thank you for Alex and his life and his family and just the opportunities that we're going to have to share his story today. Father, would you be glorified in this? It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Cool. Would you like this new setup that we've got? I do. We still have to take down some Christmas decorations here. Um, it was a great season, and we're looking forward to all that God's going to do in this new year. Um, so start out for me, Alex. You know I've known each other for kind of, we're pushing a year. I mean, getting right. close to yeah. you at Rolling Kills. Um, just go ahead and give some background. What do you do here in Franklin? Start out with job. Uh, first, uh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks it's for being uh, here. It's a big honor to uh, be a part of this. It, uh, well, for work, I work for the city of Franklin in the uh, Building and Neighborhood Services Department. And uh, my title is Permitting Operations Supervisor. So me and my team, we, we manage development projects from start to finish, from development plan submittals all the way down to issuing building permits, and at the end, issuing certificates of occupancy for homeowners it's and kind businesses of an, and whatnot. An so. easy job, because Franklin's not really growing. Yeah, it's pretty easy, yeah. <laughs> not at all. Good deal. All right, so now go into the family yeah. side of life. Like, tell us about your family. So the reason I work is to provide for my family. This, this is where the good stuff comes in. And uh, I love my job, but uh, I tell everybody I work with, we're a family there, and we do work so we can provide for our family outside of there, you know. And I have a son, he'll be four on the 28th in about two weeks. That's right? awesome. Uh, Beckett and my wife, Lindsay, and I have been married for about six and a half years, uh, May 7th of 2011. And um, there's nothing like, as you know, being a husband and a father. And uh, that's really where God shows you, or has shown me, uh, what life's all about. Good deal. Yeah. And part of your life in the last year, I mean, you've gone through a lot of transformations right. in your lives, and we're in your life, and we're going to get to that. Um, but part of your life in, in in this last year is is coming to know Christ and mm -hmm. to surrendering your life to Him. Um, so tell us just to kind of set that up um, a little bit about your life before Christ. Um, you're a Tennessee native, right? Like you grew up here. <clears throat> yeah. So I was born and raised here in Franklin. Um, went to Bethesda Elementary, Page Middle, Page High School. Graduated. Went to Tennessee Tech University in Cookville mm -hmm. and uh, got a business management degree from there. Uh, soon thereafter, moved with some friends to Murfreesboro and then back to Franklin after a couple of years, right? So I've always loved this, this town. It's got the small town feel mm -hmm. with a lot of opportunities and whatnot. And, um, you know, I played sports at, you know, basketball and football and, you know, baseball as a young kid. And, uh, you know, life as a kid, uh, pretty normal uh, Southern family uh, upbringing, you know, went to church every Sunday, grandparents sat in the same seat in the pew for 50 years straight, right? Church of Christ, uh, Fourth Avenue Church of Christ here in Franklin, mm -hmm. and uh, was really involved in youth group activities and um, learned what God is and who he is at an early age. Uh, they had a strong youth group and, and uh, loved uh, 
everything about it actually. Church camp every year and um, active in all the things that youth groups do, right? And uh, <clears throat> there was something different at, a, at an early age. Um, a lot of my friends were getting baptized very early, right? At church camps and uh, weekend trips and whatnot. Uh, Winterfest was one of those, mm -hmm. right? In Gatlinburg, but uh, there was something um, in me at an early age that said, "I want to figure it out. I want to. I know what this is supposed to be, right? But I want to figure it out through whatever God's got in the store, right? I'm pretty hard-headed, so that's what that meant, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good. And uh, <clears throat> so the off uh, off to my journey, I went right, and. Uh, so that's how life was as a kid. I, you know, I was raised by two great parents. Uh, they still live here in Franklin. They're both still alive, and we're very uh, fortunate to have them around. They're, they're great people. Couldn't have raised me any better. And my brother Josh lives here in Franklin, has three kids, six years old and under. And uh, so it's, it's great. Our, our, my family's close. My wife's family's close. They live in Hermitage. She grew up in Hermitage, went to Good Pasture. And... Uh, kind of the same upbringing, me and her both, just on different uh, tracks uh, to get to the point to where we met in both of our journeys, and I'll get to that later on, but it, yeah. uh, <clears throat> it got pretty interesting there. Throughout the, from youth group until Rolling Hills was a big... Well, go into it and, and share a little bit more about what that part of your story was like. Okay, so, <clears throat> like I said, I was early, you know, early youth... Uh, Christian, you know, I was mm -hmm. always, I always knew God and what, what God was and is. And uh, at 10 years old, I was diagnosed, I had perfect vision until mm -hmm. I was 10 years old. I was diagnosed with a rare optic nerve disease uh, called Labor's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy. It's a, uh, at the time it was, I was one of the youngest people to ever be diagnosed. And it took two years for them to really figure out what was going on. So it, it was really hard um, on my family, right? Cause they, you know, I thought I had a brain tumor or two, all kinds of stuff. And I finally got diagnosed in uh, Miami University in Miami, Florida, mm -hmm. right? University of Miami and um, by a specialist down there. So from 10 to 12 years old, <clears throat> there was a, uh, you know, I, I can see, I can see you fine. It's mm -hmm. just like reading small print and depth perception. But, you know, when you're a kid and uh, kids sometimes aren't very nice, right? Oh, yeah. And you hear the term bully and stuff like that now a lot more, right? But oh, I, yeah. I was bullied, and, and, and that's okay. You know, it's just, it is what it is, right? Um, but looking back, it was, it was hurtful, and, um, you know, it, it left some scar tissue there. That, that it's still there if I really open up that chapter and, and look back at it and touch it and feel it and, and uh, really get to know what that felt like again. Right, because I at an early age I went through a lot of stuff from 10 to 12 years old. So mm -hmm. I was still very active playing sports. You know, I, I played on the ninth grade basketball team. I was uh, started both ways in football. I was a captain on the wrestling team a few years, whatnot. So I was very active. I didn't let it stop me doing anything. It, that took some work getting me to the to the attitude that I came to later in life. Right? You know, because people get a disability. You know, I'm legally blind. I don't drive, right? So be it. You know, that's <laughs> that's what God gave me. Now, I didn't think that way for a long time. Sure. I do now, and I have for many years. But um, <clears throat> so as, as you're growing up as a teenager and you don't drive, everybody's getting their driver's licenses, and, you know, it's pretty tough. And uh, so I turned to other um, activities, and it wasn't something I'd strive to do, that, you know, you get asked when you're younger, what do you want to be when you grow up? And normally it's a professional athlete. Actually, mine was a, a Marine or a uh, Olympic wrestler. That yeah. was what I wanted to be. <laughs> good aspirations. Absolutely. Yeah, they were. Yeah. yeah. And uh, couldn't be a Marine and I wasn't good enough to be an Olympic wrestler. So Had there you are. Something else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was a decent wrestler, but, you know, that's next level good. So, <clears throat> so I turned to uh, other things to kind of medicate my mind and, and spirit. Um, at an early age, right? You know, was, back then I, I thought it was just what teenagers do, right? Go sure. out and hang out and 
after the football games and uh, have a party or whatnot, you know. So, um, so through high school and then into college, uh, those lifestyles continued. Um, you know, I still, I, I was still, I've always been a people pleaser and didn't want to say no to anything and, and whatnot. Um, and my, it's funny, my parents always says, you can say no, right? To, and that's just, I, I didn't like doing that back then because it felt like I couldn't give, you know, what somebody was asking because I felt like, I guess in the back of my mind, I felt like I was less than. So mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to give whenever somebody asked, right? Or do whatever. <clears throat> and one of the challenges of being a man is being performance driven. Right. And right. wanting to not just please people, but excel and even impress people. Mm-hmm. And I think we all struggle with that to a degree. Right. And, and sometimes it manifests itself in just, you know, goal setting and entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and just success in life. Right. Um, and sometimes it manifests itself into um, some dangerous things, mm-hmm. um, some things that pop up in, as, as pride or um, fear and right. doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, what I learned <clears throat> actually in the last uh, six, seven years is it was all ego driven, you know, and, and now that I know what ego means. It's easing God out sort yeah. of. Thing. That's what ego stands for. In my book, it does. Right? Yeah. And um, anything ego driven and driven and fear based is it's going to lead to some bad activities. And uh, that's what I was living. I was living in fear and um, regret and all the, the stuff that will really take you down, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so those, those lifestyles and... and uh, how, so, did, how did God begin to get a hold of your life out of all of that? Well, it's, it's funny because... <clears throat> so I'd be out uh, hanging out with friends and, or, or doing whatever, and uh, we'd have too much to drink or whatnot. And... I'd start talking to people about God. It was it was kind of weird, but uh, you know, at a, at a young age, I knew what God was. I hadn't been baptized. I hadn't been saved. I pushed myself away from all that stuff because when I was younger, I saw things in church, quite honestly, that were one one against everything that I believed should have been in a Christian person, mm-hmm. right? So I had a lot of resentment built up, deep seated resentment about some things. Um, that went on and were continuing to, to happen, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so God was working on me at a very early age. And, you know, it's, I, I truly believe that God puts people on a, a path, right, a plan uh, that he has set forth. Some call it predestination. I call that uh, his markers throughout the path, right? Yeah. That uh, will let you see what he does and how he does it and, and it'll put you in life situations to where you can see his hand at work and then you have a choice to whether you're going to go this way or that way. Mm-hmm. Right, so there was many of those throughout the path, right? You know, when I was 19, I lost one of my best friends uh, who died in the Marines, right, mm-hmm. in a training accident. Wow. Um, you know, I lost my Aunt Ruth, who was like my grandmother, my mom's aunt, right? And, um, and then my, my grandfather passed away. And then this is over a, quite a few years, right? And then uh, one of my best friends, Elizabeth Johnson, died in a car wreck on the way to my house and I'd call her and say, won't you come hang out tonight? Well, now she, she mm-hmm. was coming from Knoxville to Cookville and died in a terrible car wreck on the way to my house. So, you know, there's just... <clears throat> they start to pile on you. It, it does. One it, at a time. It does. And it, I was always able to get through those, those grieving periods quickly because I always had God on my side. I used, <laughs> I used him when I needed him mm-hmm. back then, right? Yeah. Um, they call them foxhole prayers. You only pray when your your tail's on the line right oh yeah (laughs) absolutely and that's a yeah i I think um one of the guys that i listen to a lot and then i I love to hear sermons from is is a pastor in texas and matt chandler Mm -hmm. i mean he says one of the most difficult places to be um, a pastor or a teacher a minister is right here in this bible belt Mm -hmm. where we all grew up with just enough jesus Mm -hmm. um to think that we get by Mm -hmm. and uh and it's that it's that insurance prayer that you pray. It's that foxhole prayer that you right. mentioned, the idea that I know enough about God to pull him out of my pocket and use him when I need him, mm-hmm. but I don't have to need him every day. Right. And that's a challenge, yeah. And then set him aside when, mm-hmm. oh, I got this figured out. Everything's good. I've got a little money back in my pocket. I'm not overdrawing the bank. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've been sober for a few days straight here, which kind of was rare, but, um, you know, just things like that. I start feeling good. Mm-hmm. And then you push God away again, you know. Yeah. That's just, that, that's what I was doing for many, many years. I mean, it started at an early age, you know. From 15 to 33, that, that was me, 
Mm -hmm. you know? And it was, you know, looking back after taking a lot of good inventory about why that was like that. I mean, there was some pretty dark times um, that caused that. So I could trace it back to different things. Um, and I, always, I use it now to, to share with other men and other women that, uh, you know, we could go further into that, that part if you like. But Yeah. I want to talk about that for a minute, if you will, the idea, because you've mentioned alcohol, and I know that you and I have talked about addiction before. Right. What is it that God did in your life to pull you out of that? Okay. So being fully transparent, I, I, I got sober uh, May 21st of 2010. That's right? amazing. It, it, <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Uh, just today, right? That's, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. It is. It's actually unbelievable. It really is. It, uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's the biggest miracle I've ever seen, right? And it's, it's that time thing. It, it, sometimes it feels like it's 20 years ago. Sometimes it feels like it was last week sort of thing. And uh, so I'm active in recovery mm -hmm. in the community here, right? Take meetings into the Williams County Jail system. Have done that for about five years. Yeah. Uh, there's a group of men that do that on a rotating basis. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. But So um, people struggle with with a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the numbers are staggering, really. I think it's one in every two or one in every three households on any street in America, or in the world for that matter. Mm -hmm. Somebody's dealing with an addiction of some sort, right? Whether it be drinking or drugs or sex addiction or porn addiction or overeating or, oh, yeah. or whatever, right? Shopping addiction mm -hmm. or hoarding, whatever, right? An addiction, really is, is something that controls your thinking and your, your life and and it's it's kind of a it's not kind of it's a hopeless uh, place you know it's a hopeless mind body spirit sort of mm -hmm. thing right so I had gotten to the end of my another one of those markers right that God puts you on the path to find uh, I've been to a bunch of bunch of things throughout those 17 or 18 years right mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of my choices. I, I, I can't blame anybody but myself. I, I was the one that got me there, and I had to be the one to get me out of there. Right? So uh, I checked myself into a treatment center, and uh, it was time to do something about it. I'd, I had met some couple guys along the way that had been to this place in uh, Burns, Tennessee, and they were happy, very happy, and it was hard to understand because <laughs> they, they had the story similar to mine, and they were living life sober and happy, and it was crazy to me mm -hmm. at the time because I was scared of that. I wanted it, but I was scared of it. Oh, yeah. It's kind of strange. But. So I went to uh, take care of some stuff, um, a place called Discovery Place, and uh, May 21st, 2010, about 9 o'clock in the morning, I walked up the front steps and checked myself in. Right. Wow. And, uh, and that's to today, and I haven't, uh, with the help of God and, and family and friends, and, and uh, mainly God first, and then a wonderful wife and a wonderful family, and and uh, now I'm able to have wonderful friends because I can have relationships, and it's <laughs> praise God. It's beautiful. You know? Know, I love that you didn't just include um, kind of the the really dangerous and illegal addictions right. in that because. Right. Um, I think sometimes we lump those into a category, right. you know, like alcoholism or especially something like drug abuse. Mm -hmm. And we kind of put those on the sidelines of like, oh, those are really dangerous right. addictions. Right. Um, but you talk about, you know, the, the hoarding or the, the overeating mm -hmm. or um, even those can, can debilitate our lives mm -hmm. and, to, and to take control over us um, and to force us to ease God out in places when we really need his light to shine. Um, and then obviously, you know, we're sitting here as a part of Men's Leadership Network. We're talking about issues that men face. Um, and Alex mentioned pornography or sex addiction. Um, that's prevalent um, in men's lives. It's prevalent even in the church. And, and men who are actively pursuing and trying to follow Christ, it's a, a devastating temptation that controls you. What is it, you know, looking at all of that combined, any sort of addiction that men might be trapped in, mm -hmm. what, is, what is that kind of one encouraging word that you would say to somebody that's, that's struggling with some sort of addiction right now? Uh, it's hard to put it in one word, but hope, sure. R hope. Yeah. You know, because when you're, when you're in an addiction, active addiction, whatever it is, right? And I think the, the numbers are mid 70% of men deal with porn, mm -hmm. right? It's just the truth. Um, you know, I mentioned a bunch of different types of struggles that people sure. have addictions. 
Uh, I had several of those. My gambling, one of those. Yeah. Uh, drinking. It really didn't matter. I just needed more of something to change how I felt right then. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's what that's what it's, it's an all about. Instant gratification, it's instant, instant, instant gratification. change. Right, yeah. right. It's instant change, instant gratification. Change me right now because I don't like where I'm, what I am right now. Right. That's what that's mm-hmm. what causes that. You know, there's it's a psychological thing. Right. Some are very addictive, just <laughs> physically, chemically, yeah, chemically, absolutely. Right, and uh, so I had some of those, and I had some of the psychological ones too. I had a pretty good mix of stuff right so <laughs> well, praise god that you're not in that <laughs> and i don't want to you know sell myself short i was always a good sure good person yeah i just wasn't good to myself right absolutely and that's really what uh what it boils down to and people that are struggling out there right now i mean there's there's people a lot of people especially in this community and and surrounding communities who are willing to give their time and uh and as much time as it takes to help and, and that help talk, is talking with a like-minded person, uh, you know, because you share a problem and it's cut in half, right? Yeah. So. Well, one of the things that I um, um, was most impressed when we met was really in the context of men's Bible study is how early and how open you were and willing to share your story. Because mm-hmm. um, that's, you know, one of the, maybe one of the best gifts that you could ever give somebody and we're off of this season of you know gift gin, gift giving and you know there's crazy spending and we can look at the stats of all that but one of the the, really the, the deepest most intentional things that you can give somebody is is a piece of your story right um, what's transpired in you and you did that in men's bible study for us and we had witnessed you um in baptism you mm-hmm. know and knowing that god was doing something in your life and so i want to talk about that in a minute but i just wanted to just kind of throw out there Thanks for being somebody that's willing to share your story. Thanks for sharing it in the context of Bible study, even in the context of this interview, and we don't know how far this will go. Thanks for sharing it with um, inmates and other people who need mm-hmm. um, recovery, somebody to invest in their life, and that's a, that's a neat thing. Tell me how you came to the baptism point um, in well, your life. First, thank you for saying that. Yeah. And it's all God's work. Oh, absolutely. And I just tell, I've been working with a, I'll get to that. The baptism part, yeah, yeah we'll just, go there. <laughs> but real quick, I've been, uh, I mentioned my buddy that passed away in the Marines, right? Oh, yeah. His, uh, one of his brothers was, had gone through some of the similar things I had been going through for years, but mm-hmm. he, he uh, got himself a little uh, mess and has spent some time away from his family, if you know what I mean. And yeah. uh, I've been working with him for the last seven or eight months now, I guess. And he, he got to come home Monday, and uh, he's got two young children. It's, you know, he, he tells me, thank you, and I, First time I said, you're welcome. Well, yeah, that's all I can do. It's the best I can do, right? Yeah. Next time I said, just <laughs> instead of thanking me, take care of your family, take care of your stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, that, that would mean more of a thank you than anything in this world. Yeah. To see that it actually helped somebody, right. that it helped to do something right. in their lives, that's, right. a, that's a, a right. great form of gratitude. Right, it is, yeah. So the baptism part. So <clears throat> I mentioned that I, I, I had never been baptized and, or saved or you know, stuff until I figured I was ready. You know, I'm, I want to learn through life, and I, I did. I learned through a whole lot of life lessons, right, mm-hmm. uh, of what God is and how he works. And I originally, back in 2001, I believe it was, maybe 2000, those years kind of run together a little bit, and it's almost 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's hard how time flies, yeah. <laughs> but um, I was in a relationship with a girl in college. We were about to get engaged, so we, me and her family would go to – little Baptist church in McMinnville, Tennessee. And uh, so one Sunday morning, they all, her family sat on the front row, and her little brother was probably the most godlike person mm-hmm. I have ever met, quite honestly. Um, but uh, so one day the, the preacher hit me with some real, uh, real stuff, right? You know, he stopped his sermon and uh, said, somebody in here needs to hear my story, and I'll make this pretty quick. But he... Uh, he mentioned that he came up on a car that was on fire and uh, his son was with him and he got out and they were first people there and tried to pull the person out, right? And mm-hmm. watch the person die. Well, that was crazy because when I was in ninth grade, me and my brother were on the way to school one day and we came up on a wreck and it was one of his best friends and uh, the car was on fire smoking, right? And it started burning mm-hmm. and uh, Gary Brennan was his name. And uh, so we sat there and watched him burn to death. I couldn't turn away. Mm. So 
that, that was uh, that's one of those I had to really go I had to go talk to somebody about you know counseling or whatnot. But uh, so that one that one really scarred scarred me. I did, didn't realize how much. But whenever uh, Steve Breedlove, the preacher I'm talking about at Friendship Baptist in McMinnville, he uh, he brought that up, and I was just broke down. I was like, "This is crazy." He's describing exactly what I saw, and nobody has ever said anything like that. I mean, mm-hmm. described exactly what happened. So there was a couple other things about being a brother's keeper and whatnot, and uh, so I got saved that day, right, wow. in a Baptist church. And uh, you know, <laughs> you would think that would be my time, right? Sure. <laughs> No, it wasn't my time. It was uh, I came out of there with some sort of doubt somewhere that God knew about. I wasn't fully 100% in, right? So that's when the real beatdown of, of life, right? Um, the journey really got real, and it got extremely real for about nine years straight, right, until May of 2010. <clears throat> Put through a whole lot of stuff that I never thought I'd go through. But anyhow, so... I was saved then, right? So that in, in some settings you hear that saved is, is the, you've confessed to the mouth, to believe with the heart. You're saved, you're good, you're in. Yeah, the work you're of the Christ door. has accomplished <laughs> in my life. You're yeah. in the door, right? <laughs> uh, I don't believe that. I, I think you, you have to do them both, right? I think you saved and baptized. Right? Yeah. That's okay. just my belief. We'll talk about that, but keep going. I want right. to hear the rest yeah. of the story. <laughs> so... Uh, in 2010, you know, middle of 2010, I, I got to take care of some of my stuff, right, and come back home. And one of the main things of any type of uh, successful recovery is uh, finding a higher power that uh, can restore you to sanity. Or, uh, that's the basis of it at first. Sure. And then you start working on all the other stuff. But, so I really started to understand how to uh, pray. I still don't understand how to pray, really. I, I try my best. <laughs> sure. But I, I started trying, right? And uh, that was a big deal every morning, at least for 30 seconds, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. But don't do anything perfect. But uh, I started trying that and started working, started seeing some good results. And um, so me and Lindsay worked, worked together, my wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had tried People's Church here in Franklin. Sure. A great place. Oh, absolutely. Great place. And uh, we lived right close to there. But uh, so we had, I didn't really have a lot of friends when I came out, right, because a lot of my friends were still sure. doing their thing. and They don't just come hunt you down ready to hang out. Mm-hmm. We, we, whatever. We um, moved to Canterbury Subdivision, Tom Station, and we're there for about a year and a half, two years. And a really nice older couple lived right beside us, right? And the, the older gentleman passed away. He got sick. He was just a great guy. But <clears throat> And then the next neighbors, the Alaska people. <laughs> yep. I know who you're talking about. You get there. <laughs> they moved in, right? Uh, Peter and Katie Goodwin and uh-huh. their kids, right? And it was just kind of instant friendship sort of thing because we'd open the door, they'd open the door, the kids would play, and uh, we'd just go out and hang out you know, pretty much every night. And they, uh, they were currently coming, they had started, they went to a different church and they started coming to Rolling Hills, right? But they kept, Peter's a, a unique individual, he's a great guy, great man, Katie's a great, great lady, great girl, young yeah. lady. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, they'd always invite us to come to church on Sunday, right? And we had an excuse, we had an excuse. Because that was our sleep in day, mm-hmm. right? But, uh, July 4th of this year, actually, right? Yeah. They came over to our house. Our, we had moved down the street, a couple miles down the road to another neighborhood. But we invited him over, and uh, he just asked, we were out there shooting fireworks. He said, uh, y'all want to come to church tomorrow? This was a 4th of July. was on a Sunday mm-hmm. this year. No, it was on a Saturday. Saturday. He was going to watch you for the right, next day. Right, yeah. yeah, that's what it was. So, like, sure. We didn't have an excuse, finally. Mm-hmm. It was just God's timing, right? So we came. It, it was, I promise you, uh, it wasn't 15 minutes after we walked in the door here, we, we felt at home. It, it felt just like home, it, and it still does, and, it, that's what, and it gets better and better. But, uh, yeah. So I told Lindsay if, after the first day here, right, on the way home or soon thereafter, I said, uh, that's where I want to get baptized. 
because I always said I'm going to get baptized when I find a home, church home, mm-hmm. that I can. There's just no expectations here. You just come, you you grow with your community, you uh, build relationships. The singing's unbelievable. The preaching's unbelievable, and it, it just feels like you're walking in another house, another second home when you get here. Yeah. And and God's here 100. percent So. Uh, January 30th, I believe it was, last Sunday in, in, not January, July, last Sunday in July of that month, I got baptized here. Yeah, I remember that day, yeah. and, and Peter got to do your baptism. Yeah, so I asked uh, Peter, yeah. Which made it incredibly more special to right. see that happen. It was, he was kind of blown away when I asked him, mm-hmm. um, but I, it was a quick decision. I, I knew right away when I figured I was going to get baptized, and I'm going to ask Peter, because he's the one that got me, brought me yeah. back to a church, right? And there was a level Through of God. persistence in his life, um, just kind of reaching out, ministering, dropping it, saying, you know, consistency with right, you right. in order to get you He texted on a Saturday night or, or call or, or mm-hmm. whatever, and just say, you want to come to church. There was no uh, begging or, or bothering or none of that mm-hmm. stuff. And he, he, Peter was just one of the m- many Christian men in my life uh, throughout the journey, right? Here in the last several years, I, uh, Trey and Doug, a couple of men I work with, um, they are some really strong Christian men, just like Peter, just like yourself, right? Um, something I strive to hope to get to. I think I'm getting there, but, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're they just at a different... Uh, I don't like to compare how strong a Christian you are. You know, I don't like doing journey. that. Yeah, different it's a journey, right, on the right, journey. Right. Yeah. So, but they, uh, I, they work directly with me on my mm-hmm. team, right? And yeah. uh, that's how we succeed. You know, we, we end each, each team meeting with a prayer. Sometimes we start in it. Sometimes we'll do one in the middle, I in a work that. setting, right? And it's it, that's what keeps us focused, and, and uh, we've been doing that for years. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> now I'm gonna kind of sum up some things. Some, there's some we've talked about a lot of different things, a lot of right. different parts of your life, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of themes that could come out of this that um, different men would gravitate to. Um, we talk about um, addiction, and we talk about recovery, and we talk about um, even counseling the, the scars and the hurts in our lives, and and so I just I kind of feel. Um, like it'd be really important to say that anybody that is tuning in, if that's part of your story, if that's part of your struggle, um, then, then we want to be a place of healing and a place where uh, you take a next step towards wholeness for that. Um, Rolling Hills does offer a counseling service. Um, there are opportunities to plug in and get connected to somebody who can help. Any one of the guys who are plugged into Men's Leadership Network would be happy for a reach out to say, hey, let's get you connected with something that's going to get you help for whatever that next step is. And then we talk about salvation and baptism. Um, I think that's a theme in a lot of people's lives. That, yeah. that moment where you say, okay, I'm at the bottom or I'm at this place where I say, I'm going to trust Jesus yeah. because I don't have anywhere else to go. Right. And I do believe that he accomplished the work of salvation in my life. But then there is that step of obedience, mm-hmm. that step of obedience. And for some people, it comes immediately. Like, I trust Christ for salvation and I'm going to be baptized. For a lot of others, it's like you years and years later mm-hmm. where somebody gets to the point where they say, I'm now going to follow Christ, whether it's in baptism, in leadership, in prayer, in ministry, in whatever steps he has for my life. Um, we can separate those out and say, trusting Christ for salvation, that's the moment I know my eternity is secure. But baptism is a step of obedience that takes us even closer to Christ and his purpose for our lives. And that's a beautiful picture. And then we get to the point where it's time to share our story with somebody else, knowing that the story that we have can be used to impact others' lives. Um, is a really good theme. And I love how you kind of summed it up at the end with the other men, like Peter or Trey and the other fellow that you mentioned, yeah. who, are, who are investing in you. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know how our story and how our life and how our impact can minister to somebody else. Um, and so maybe that's a good challenge for us in 2018 to say, I want whatever God's doing in my life to be an opportunity for somebody else to see Christ and to know him and to be invited to follow him. Um, maybe we, like Peter, need to get a little bit more consistent and insistent upon somebody else coming to church, um, knowing that there are places for them, um, because they're definitely Peter and people in all of our lives that we can invite, that we can invest, and that we can see come to know Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you and I are going to continue this conversation yes, and continue the journey, and we engaging in Bible studies and small groups. And um, I just want to say that I'm thankful for you today, being Thank willing you so to go much through this interview. Um, and I'm thankful in advance um, for other men that might listen, that might tune in, that might share this, and might see great things happen as a result of Alex's story. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for this day again, and thank you for the chance to 
um, just to chat and to share the things that you have accomplished and that you're doing in Alex's life. And one of the things he said is that this is a journey and he's at this spot, but we know that you've got tons of plans for him laid out, God, plans that you prepared in advance uh, for him to do the good works that you've called him to. And so, Father, I pray that you would continue to lead, to guide, and to direct, um, and to use him in incredible ways. Um, Father, would you do that for all of us? Um, for those of us who are um, stuck in a spot where um, addiction and struggle and scarring is an issue, Father, I pray for healing, and I pray for wholeness, and I pray for help, help that only you can provide. Um, for men who are out there questioning um, salvation and eternity and who you are in life, Father, I pray for um, godly men to come and to speak eternal truths. And I pray that you would help us to be a resource for men to find salvation and learn what it means to follow Christ. Um, it's in his holy, perfect name that we pray today. Amen. Amen.